Good evening. We're going to give folks a moment to, to get on. Um, so we'll start in just a moment or two. Or three. Or three. Well, it's 7 one already, Adrian. <laughs> I know people are still logging on. Logging on. All right, we're going to start in just one moment, give people another second to log on. Let the train go by my apartment. <laughs> okay, great. I think we'll start. Good evening. My name is Julie Tai, and I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. I'm excited to be here tonight with our partner, Citizens Campaign for the Environment, and Orsett and Eversource tonight to learn more about and celebrate renewable energy and offshore wind for New York as we approach the time when offshore wind moves from being a concept and into turbines spinning off our shores to provide clean energy for our communities. This webinar is part of our ongoing partnership with CCE to educate New Yorkers about issues related to clean energy, in particular offshore wind, and provide opportunities for you to get updates on the status of projects that are moving forward in our state. As the state is looking to transition to a green economy, we'll be electrifying much more of our transportation system and changing how we heat and cool our homes. And the linchpin to this transition is to switch our energy sources to renewables. That's why advancing clean energy and offshore wind in a way that protects the environment and our communities is a top priority for us at NMILCV Education Fund. Wind energy can power millions of homes across New York, contribute to our economic recovery, create green jobs, support our communities and slash pollution, all while keeping marine life safe. Offshore wind is already making New Long Island a leader in green power. In 2019, New York committed to bringing 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind online by 2035. New York currently has five offshore wind projects in active development, the largest offshore wind pipeline in the nation. More than 4,300 megawatts are under contract with the state, representing nearly 50% of the capacity needed to meet New York's offshore wind goal of 9,000 megawatts by 2035. And just today, we we're very excited that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, announced the sale of leases for six new areas in the New York Bight in the Atlantic off the coast, the coast of New York and New Jersey, which will enable both of our states to keep moving forward on our clean energy goals. And we have one of the most ambitious climate laws in the world, and we're already a leader in offshore wind development. Uh, through the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, New York has set a goal of zero emission electricity by 2040, including 70% renewable energy generation by 2030, and we aim to reach an economy-wide uh, carbon neutrality. Building off of today's announcement about the new offshore wind lease areas, Governor Hochul committed in her State of the State address last week to procure up to two gigawatts of offshore wind as the state seeks to reduce reliance on polluting fossil fuel powered plants, enough to power 1.5 million homes, bringing the, nation, the state's combined total to more than 4.5 million homes powered by offshore wind. But she went further and she made commitments to investing $500 million in critical offshore wind infrastructure in ports, manufacturing and supply chain infrastructure, leveraging private capital to deliver more than $2 billion in economic activity and create more than 2000 good paying green jobs. They are planning to initiate a future offshore wind transmission network to power up to 4 million New York City homes to identify strategic offshore wind cables and access point of the onshore transmission grid that can interconnect at least six gigawatts of offshore wind into New York City. And they're launching the 2.0 of the offshore wind master plan for deep water. Building on the success of their award-winning offshore wind master plan, uh, they will initiate this, this new plan to look at the next frontier of offshore wind development. And ultimately, Offshore wind will help us reduce our reliance on power plants, which are all too often polluting our environmental justice frontline communities. By developing offshore wind projects in these windy areas, 
New York can continue to be a leader in the industry, and these initiatives will not only help us meet our climate goals, but also create good jobs. We're excited to hear from experts from Orsted and Eversource on their active offshore wind projects tonight. And now I'll be handing this over to my partner, Adrian Esposito. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Adrian Esposito. I'm the executive director of Citizens Campaign for the Environment. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And as Julie said, look, this is a good news time uh, for offshore wind and renewable energy in general. And you might be saying to yourself, why do we need to do this? Well, we need to do this uh, because I know this won't be shocking for many of you, you know, climate change is real. And if we just look at some of the headlines over the last couple of weeks or a couple of months, uh, we find that the last seven years have been the warmest on record since, uh, you know, since they've been keeping track of um, yearly temperatures. Uh, another fun fact is that the ocean water temperature is the highest it's been ever since ocean water temperatures have been recorded and that has been done. Uh, they've been monitored for the last six decades. And the higher the water temperature in the oceans are, the more climate change will accelerate. And then sometimes people will ask, and some of you might ask at the end of this webinar, what is the cost of wind? And I want you to know that's a good question, but it needs to be answered in the context of what is the cost of climate change? New report just out this week that weather uh, disasters fueled by climate change cost the United States of America $750 billion over the last five years. That's a hefty price tag. In 2021, just last year, there were 20 separate large scale climate events that cost us $145 billion to recover from. Those are high costs associated with climate change. So whether it's tornadoes or hurricanes or fire or drought or pounding rain events, you name it, that not only causes property damage, lives have been lost, in specific, 688 lives last year were lost because of climate events. So when we talk about the cost of transitioning from fossil fuels to rene renewables, we need to compare that to the cost of doing nothing, which is what we're paying right now. And this is exciting times. I mean, we are watching an historic moment right now. We are transitioning from a fossil fuel and an oil-based economy to renewable energy. And the benefits of that are numerous. So that's why CCE and the League of Conservation Voters have teamed up to partner in supporting offshore wind with a rigorous and site-specific environmental review. Um, you know, it's not a free pass, but it is a necessity to make this transition so that we can fight climate change. We can have a sustainable planet. And I know there's people from all over the state of New York and Connecticut on with us tonight. But those of you who live on Long Island, we're on the front lines. We're on the front lines of climate change. And I think it was pretty disturbing for us to um, realize that six tornadoes touched down last September. And that was another first in history. So whether it's rising sea levels, tornadoes touching down, hurricanes, um, we're on the front lines and we need to act. And we're happy and, and pleased uh, that we're in a state that is acting. And that's you know the state of New York, which is bringing change. So we're delighted to be able to bring to you uh, one of the offshore wind uh, companies called Orsted. They have contracted for two different of the five offshore wind farms that have now are moving through the siting and the permitting process in New York State. And they're gonna to talk to us about their two projects. Um, we are happy to have with us this evening, Jen Garvey, who uh, leads the market, uh, fa market affairs uh, for Orsted, New York. And also Ken Bowes, who's the vice president of offshore wind permitting and siting for Eversource Energy. You may, and they'll tell you this, but their projects, uh, actually both of their projects, will be directly connecting into the Long Island market. So I'm gonna turn it over right now to Jennifer Garvey. Jennifer? Okay, good evening. 
Are we good? Are we up? Am I up? Okay. Yes, you're good. <laughs> good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you kindly for, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you to the New York League of Conservation Voters. Thank you to Citizens Campaign for the Environment. Thank you, Julie and Adrian specifically. And uh, you know, we're really pleased to have this opportunity this evening to, to share your evening, frankly, uh, and to talk to you about our projects. I do have a couple of slides, some slides that we'll be putting up. So Mike, if you wouldn't mind sharing those. Um, and while he's working on those, I'll just say that um, obviously exciting day today for the industry in general, you know, we couldn't, couldn't have picked a better day to be talking about offshore wind, uh, just keep the momentum going here. But uh, you know, offshore wind is, it's, Obviously, our A number one goal we have to is, is protecting our planet. It's the transition to clean energy. Um, but offshore wind is also about opportunity. There is so much opportunity that comes with the emergence of this industry here in the U.S. Uh, this is this is a multi-billion dollar industry that's emerging. Uh, our, our couple of projects alone represent hundreds of millions of dollars being invested into New York. Um, there's more to come. There's other developers. And obviously, as we saw today, there'll be uh, an even greater queue of projects uh, going forward to, to, uh, to, in order to reach the state goals, the federal goal goals uh, for offshore wind. And so this is a, a really exciting time. So uh, we thank you uh, for this, for this uh, opportunity. And I will say, you know, there's a lot of people who follow along with our projects really closely. We've got a, a great audience today, a big audience, um, diverse. And so for some of you, this will, I, I hope this feels like not totally new material. We are, you're hearing about the milestones that we talk about along the way. I know for some of you, this is also totally brand new. And so welcome. Um, but we have a great story to talk about. We've hit a lot of milestones this year for our projects, and we are starting construction on New York's first uh, offshore wind farm, farm in just a few weeks here. So um, lots to look forward to. Mike, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, well, first a little bit about our, our team, our joint venture team. Obviously, I'm from Orsted. Um, our joint venture partner is Eversource. Um, Orsted is a renewable energy company. We are the global leader in offshore wind. Uh, Orsted was actually the very first to install turbines in the water off the coast of Denmark. That was back in 1991. Uh, today, we own and operate about 25% of all offshore wind in operation. It's over 1,000 uh, turbines. I think it's in excess of 1,200 turbines at this point around the globe. Uh, so it's, it's our core business. Um, we are actually an oil and natural gas company that transitioned into a renewable energy company. So it's a really cool story. And hey, if we can do it, others can do it too. Uh, Eversource is New England's largest energy provider. Uh, it's also a company with a more than 100 year history of working in the Northeast. They know our energy systems, our energy needs, the nature of our uh, rely reliability systems. And they are a, a really terrific uh, experienced partner to have, uh, you know, as we, as particularly as we move into this construction phase, um, and they too have a, a very well recognized uh, track record in energy efficiency and also sustainability. So uh, together, I think we've got a really fantastic team to deliver on projects for New York. Next slide. <clears throat> so just getting right into it. Um, this is the this is the lease area that we have. We talked about some of the lease areas, obviously that are that are coming online or about to become available, um, that are farther offshore. But these dark blue lease areas are the two are the combination of lease areas that we own together as a joint venture team, and this is where our projects will be located. Um, they are about. 30 miles at the closest point to the tip of New York, their Machoc Point, the most easterly point, the most easterly uh, uh, area in, in New York uh, to, to these lease areas. And we are, we are developing two projects within this lease areas um, for New York, the two that are dotted here on the map. The first one is South Fork Wind on the east end of Long Island. Uh, that one will connect into the town of East Hampton. It's a smaller project, about 132 megawatts, but still power for 70,000 uh, 70, homes each year. The second project is Sunrise Wind, a much larger project, and that will connect into the middle of Long Island there, into the town of Brookhaven, a community called Holbrook. Um, and this area, out of this lease area, we're also building a project for uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut. It's called Revolution Wind. And we have a lot of capacity left to build more projects. So um, hopefully more to come on that front for New York as well. But just wanted to point to the proximity of our lease areas relative to, uh, to New York and, and other states. And uh, we can head to the next slide. 
So in terms of timelines, you know, these projects are obviously moving on, they started at very different points in time, they're moving at different paces. Um, South Fork Wind is our, our trailblazer here. It began in 2017 with an award from LIPA. Uh, and since it takes some time after you get an award to, you know, to, to kind of put your permit applications together, there's a lot of community output or, or community engagement involved in this effort uh, to try and craft the right uh, application to go forward to the permitting agencies. And our, our permitting story began in 2018. And obviously it's taken us several years. Here we are in 2022 and uh, we are just days away, we hope from securing uh, our final permits, the permits that will allow us to start construction. Uh, and that is scheduled to begin at the end of January. So uh, just a, a high level look at the number of years it takes to get a wind farm going. Um, we think that some future projects might move a little faster. Uh, I will say that we're, there was a, a change in administration. The Biden administration has obviously been hugely supportive of offshore wind. We did see a bit of a slowdown during the, during the prior administration, and, and, and we have that to attribute to uh, some, of the, some of the delay in, in permitting here. But um, we're, moving, we're moving ahead with, South, with Sunrise Wind at, at, a, at a good clip. Um, a project award in 2019 from NYSERDA as part of New York State's broader master plan for offshore wind. It was the very first project to be awarded as in the first solicitation that NYSERDA ran. Um, again, it takes many months to put your permit applications together. It's a lot of community uh, community input together. And I, I wanna to emphasize too that throughout the entire permitting process, input is central to you know, the way that, uh, pro that projects are reviewed. And so we're, we're constantly hearing from communities and from stakeholders about what might improve projects and, and looking to incorporate that feedback. Um, and as you can see here, it does take a number of years before we can start construction. But um, relative to the, to the whole time frame, you can see the, the, yellow, the, the yellow arrows is, are obviously where we are today um, for each of our projects. Um, just getting ready for start construction for one and about midway through permitting for the other. Uh, but we've got a lot of other milestones that we're hitting in the meantime while we we'll go through these permitting <clears> exercises <throat> that we'll get to. Next slide. So South Fork Wind is our, as I mentioned, our, our trailblazing project for New York. It's New York's very first offshore wind farm. Um, this was uh, a, a project that was awarded by LIPA back in 2017 in response to an RFP that was looking for the most cost-effective way to address an energy supply need on the, uh, the, the South Fork of Long Island. Um, it was awarded together as part of a portfolio of projects um, that have already been built, some utility scale battery storage, the first in the state and a demand energy response program. It's also the, the project that's allowing LIPA to best meet its, uh, its sustainability and its sustainability goals. And this is the, you know, the home, the footprint of this project is located in the town of East Hampton. And so, um, you know, it's taken a, a huge amount of leadership on the part of the community there to, um, to embrace this project, to support some of the real estate rights that we need in order to, to make this, to, to bring this project to fruition. Um, and all of that has been secured over the past few years and in, in working closely with the community. They were, uh, they, they've been They've been participants in the permitting process, very active participants in the permitting process. Um, there's been a, a, a huge amount of engagement with the local community. They ask a lot of good questions. They certainly have, um, you know, they read things very carefully. Uh, it's a very informed community. And so um, I think it's been a, a good, the outcome of this project and some of the conditions that we've been able to put together to, to protect the environment, to protect the community, I think, uh, you know, will deliver a really excellent project. You can go to the next the next uh, slide, please. And with that, I, I'm actually going to hand this over to Ken Bose. Uh, Ken has been working for Eversource for well over 30 years now. He's built a lot of projects. Um, we couldn't ask for a better expert to be leading the way uh, for, for onshore uh, siting and, and, and you know, over, oversight of the construction phase here. And uh, Ken's going to walk us through some of the detail here on South Fork. Thank you, Jen. And, and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. So my pleasure to be with you. I know we're gonna have a Q&A session at the end as well, and we'll try to, to take as many questions as we can this evening. So with, with Jen kind of introduced uh, South Fork Wind, and what I'm gonna do now is go through several slides that talk about more of the details. We have basically completed the design phase of this project, and with that, the various state permits that go with that, 
and now, as Jen mentioned, we, we await the federal permits, the final permits next week, and then we'll begin construction. We've done many things in the design, though, to minimize impact on the community. It has been a robust stakeholder process with, with Wayne Scott and the town of East Hampton, and the state agencies have also been very active. I think they really want to make sure that the first wind farm uh, in New York has all of the right requirements that go with it, including the environmental requirements. But some of the things that we've agreed to do is maintain access to the beach and residences during construction. Uh, there are about 200 residences along the path, most of those along the Long Island Railroad, which you'll see you know, in, in a few slides. But there will be several, about 70 or so residents that we do pass by on the, the 2.4 uh, miles in town roads. We've also agreed to avoid construction during the busy summer season. Obviously, it's a very robust tourist area, lot, lots of activity in the summer months. So you're going to see us take pauses uh, for this coming summer of 2022 and also the summer of 2023. So there won't be any work done in, in town roads uh, during those summer seasons. We're also avoiding di disturbance to the beach. Um, we're gonna be drilling under the beach with a, a technology called horizontal directional drill, which I'm gonna highlight in, a, in an upcoming slide as well. Um, the town of East Hampton has some pretty um, stringent noise regulations, and we plan to comply with all of those, both during construction and also for during operation at our substation. Some of those things that we've done are limiting construction work hours, limiting time of day, seasonal, and uh, for the substation itself, it will be enclosed with a, with a perimeter wall uh, that will minimize the noise to the local community. I mentioned the cable depth or the, the HDD that allows us to drill under the beach and allows us to avoid erosion and uh, you know, exposure of the cable, which other projects have seen you know, on the coast of, of New York. So we're gonna be very deep under the, under the beach here. And there's a graphic that I'll go into with more detail. And also our, our, our main goal is here to leave the conditions better than we found them, which means repaving the streets, reseeding the areas adjacent to the streets, and really making sure that uh, the residences are, are you know, comfortable with where we've left everything at the end of construction. The next slide, please. So a little bit about the construction schedule. I know this is a, a tight slide to view and lots of detail on it but I'm gonna walk through it in, in some, uh, some detail, but it's also available and you'll see us an upcoming slide where you can view this at your leisure, uh, you know, at our website in a construction uh, tab in that uh, virtual meeting room. So here there's three segments that I'm gonna talk about. The first segment is the sea to shore transition. And that construction actually doesn't start in this spring or, or this uh, winter time. This will start in the fall of 2023, but there is work along Beach Lane that will begin. It gets us ready to do that horizontal directional drill near the end of Beach Lane. That includes putting in the duck bank and a couple splice faults, one about 500 feet off the beach, which is called the transition joint bay, which is where the horizontal directional drill will be done from, as well as where the submarine cable from offshore meets the onshore cable. And then towards the, the, the north end of Beach Lane, a vault, another vault will be installed in the duct bank between those two, uh, which is an excavation about three to four feet wide, about five to six feet deep uh, for that uh, about 2000 feet or so along Beach Lane. And that construction will start in, uh, in the end of January, February timeframe this year. The second phase is, is also on town roads and uh, it's the continuation of that and there will be work on several of the town roads that lead up to Long Island Railroad. And that type of work, you know, that's in the blue area now to the right and shows the, again, work being conducted along the Long Island Railroad, uh, continuous from this, uh, this month on uh, until about this time, a little bit later next year. That's about 13 months of construction along the Long Island Railroad. But again, the, the portion in town roads of the blue will cease at the end of April and then restart again in the fall of 2022. The third and final area is the substation itself. That's actually where the first work will start and that will be the tree clearing 
about 2.7 acres, a parcel right next to the existing National Grid Generating Plant and the existing LIPA East Hampton substation. So there'll be some clearing there done in the first quarter of this year, and then the construction of the substation will begin. And that's about a, a little over a year in duration as well. Should finish up in July of 2023. And then the testing and commissioning will begin at that substation. So there will be ongoing activity there, be much lighter in, 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 uh, in, in context, and it really deals with energizing the offshore substation and then commissioning each of the wind turbines in the summer and fall of 2023. Next slide, please. So a little bit about that sea to shore transition. And again, this work is not really starting uh, in, in the spring or the first part of, of 2022. This will be the work that we do in the fall of 2022, starting in the October timeframe and then going through the, the winter months. And what's entailed here is what's called a horizontal directional drill. It starts with an excavation and a, and a casing pipe being installed. Then a drill rig is used to drill under the beach. In this case, we have a 30 foot minimum requirement. The final design came in at about 84 and a half feet below the, the head of the beach. So it'll be much deeper than what was originally contemplated. And we were actually able to do that because of the favorable geotechnical samples that were taken. You may remember the, the large offshore rig that was used uh, a few months ago off, off Wayne Scott Beach. Those samples that we obtained allowed us to go deeper in our design and ultimately will avoid any washouts or exposure uh, on Wayne Scott Beach in the future. People that are familiar with Wayne Scott Beach, it's a very dynamic environment. And from the head of the beach out uh, into the water is about 1,700, almost 1,800 feet. So we're well into the water and uh, well beyond the, I'd say the, the near surf zone where we do have you know, many surfers and swimmers in the, in the summer months. Uh, surfers are, are there year round, but, uh, um, but again, we, we want to avoid any impacts to uh, the recreational uses at the beach, including the, in the near shore area. And this technology will allow us to do that. Again, this technology or this, uh, this time frame was number one on the, the previous slide and really starts in the fall of 2022 and will be finished up in the spring of 2023. Next slide, please. So the onshore, the work that we, we talked about along Beach Lane that will start uh, you know, in, in this time frame in the next few weeks is really excavating a duck bank. Inside the duck bank are conduits and then it's backfilled with a, a, a low grade thermal concrete so it's a softer concrete than you'd see in a, in a, say in a, in a building foundation. What it does is it allows the moisture to be absorbed in there and keeps the cables uh, nice and cool during their operating period. Um, we've had very good success with this technique. It allows for a, a very fast uh, installation and uh, we'll consider, consider about you know, one dump truck being removed per hour and one concrete truck installing this concrete per hour. So on the course of a day, you could see, you know, half a dozen to 10 trucks, both excavating and being removed, and then concrete trucks coming in at about, about one per hour to fill this in. On the right hand side, you see a, a pictorial of uh, the temporary patch that is placed over um, the duck bank and roadway. And ultimately, this will be installed uh, during the construction phase. And then ultimately, the entire road will be milled and then paved uh, from edge to edge. I would say curb to curb, but there are, there are no curbs along this portion of, of the town roads in East Hampton, but edge to edge, so the entire roadway will be, will be paved. There are 10 vaults along the, the, the path, including the one at the end of Beach Lane and uh, about five in, in pound roads beyond the transition joint bay, and then four or five along the, uh, the Long Island Railroad. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a, a, a view, view simulation before and after, and this is actually Beach Lane. What you'll notice here is a, it's the last few hundred feet of Beach Lane, and you can see where uh, on the right-hand side, there's a couple manhole covers, and that's what will be left you know, when, the, when the work is done. 
We're also been undergrounding some of the facilities here at the end of Beach Lane to allow for the work zone for this fall's work of that horizontal directional drill. So the electric, the communications and the water systems have been relocated along Beach Lane to allow this work to proceed. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a complicated slide and it's, it's a different look at uh, the actual, the offshore wind farm. So if you were looking down from an airplane, uh, this is the view that, that you would see. This diagram shows you know, the, the positions of the potential offshore wind turbines. And there were 18 total positions originally in our, in our filing with the federal government, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and our construction operations plan. Um, out of the process that went through, including the full NEPA review, which includes an environmental impact statement and working with stakeholders, both in New York, Rhode Island, and at the federal level, the National Marine Fisheries Service specifically, we've selected 12 turbine locations and one substation location. And we've really optimized the design here by selecting areas in this underlying layers of, of images as well as colors show what could be considered, and I say could be because it's, it's technically not, it's, it's, the, it's the habitat environment of the bottom of the seafloor. And what it, what it demonstrates is that the darker colors are where there's a, a higher likelihood of essential fish habitat or the spawning and development of fishing. And you can see we've selected locations that are just outside in, in, the, in the lighter colored areas, as well as routing of our cables to avoid as many of these areas as possible. And Bohm um, complimented us on our design process we went through. We didn't just look at the turbine locations. We also looked at the overall impacts of avoiding boulders, avoiding essential fish habitat in the cable routing itself to try to minimize the overall impact. You'll also see here that the turbines are spaced apart in a grid-like pattern called the one nautical mile by one nautical mile spacing. All of our projects will have this spacing in a contiguous manner. So revolution wind, south fork wind and sunrise wind, as well as future projects, sunrise two or three or four will also have this pattern. So what this allows for is safer navigation through the wind farm and ultimately the ability to do certain types of fishing within the wind farm as well. And this was approved by the US Coast Guard and really is, is the same for all of the offshore wind development for these six lease areas that are contiguous uh, off the coast of New York. It's not the same as, as it is for other locations, but these, all of these lease areas, including the ones owned by Orsted and Eversource, but also all of the other projects out there will use the same spacing. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned before that there is a, uh, a view of our construction readiness, project overview, environmental, EMF, fisheries. These, these tabs or these workrooms are all available and lots of information can be gleaned uh, at your leisure uh, to look at the South Fork Wind Farm as we uh, approach construction. And I'd encourage you to go look at some of the materials and a lot of your questions may be answered there as well. Next slide, please. At this point, I'm gonna to transition to the second project in New York, which is called the Sunrise Wind Farm. And this project, is, as Jen mentioned, is, is much larger. It's actually located in the offshore portion a little bit further to the east. So a little bit further away from, from the coast. Uh, and it also has a much longer interconnection, which you'll see in, in an upcoming slide. It's well over a hundred miles to the point we come on shore um, and about another 18 miles onshore. So it really goes into the central part of Long Island in the town of Brookhaven to a LIPA substation called Hope. And this contract was awarded in the first set of New York bids with NYSERDA. And uh, right now uh, we are in the middle of, of siting and permitting. Our federal permits have been applied for the construction and operation plan. 
We've filed several supplements based on uh, information requested from BOEM and other federal agencies. On the state side, we filed our Article 7 application. It was deemed complete last year, and we started settlement with the various stakeholders and parties, uh, which include all of the New York state agencies that would uh, regulate the project. And that's been ongoing for a little over three months now. We'll come out of the settlement process in the first quarter of this year, and uh, then have the evidentiary process if there is one, and ultimately get a commission approval about mid-year 2022. That fuels the second part of the process, which is the environmental management and construction plan. So that's a several thousand page document that really details the means and methods and all of the mitigation plans that we'll put in place to make sure the project done is, is completed in, a, uh, in an expeditious, but also an environmentally sensitive way. Um, the federal permits on this will, become, will come out in the middle of 2023, uh, the, the construction operation plan approval in August, and uh, then final permits, or I should say the record of decision in August, and the final COP approval in the fourth quarter of 2023. This project is a little bit larger. Well, it's gonna have up to you know, 100 plus turbines compared to the 12 for, um, for South Fork. So the construction period is considerably longer than it is for South Fork. But also with bigger onshore scope, I mentioned 18 miles versus the four miles for, for South Fork. A lot more jobs will be created and the substation itself for this project is is a different type of design. It's called an HVDC system. And that's really due to the length of the location from the wind farm offshore to Holbrook, 106 miles I mentioned offshore, 18 miles onshore, a very long distance. Uh, it's not the first HVDC project in Long Island. We have both the cross sound cable and the Neptune cables that uh, provide power on a daily basis to Long Island, but this will be the first uh, high voltage direct current offshore wind farm uh, in the US as well as uh, in New York. Next slide, please. So this gets into the details, as I mentioned, some of the location on the left-hand side and where the, the offshore uh, wind farm will be, the location of the export cable that goes from the offshore wind farm Smith Point County Park, where we'll come onshore. And as you see here, right hand side, we will, you know, Fire Island National Seashore is where the horizontal directional drill will start from. But then we also have a, a very long uh, horizontal directional drill under the intercoastal waterway. So that technique is used both for the sea to shore transition, but also to go under the intercoastal waterway again, to minimize the environmental impacts from the construction activities. Really has very little impact except at the two locations where you, you know, start the, the drill and where the drill comes out. In this case, we'll drill from the mainland out to the Fire Island and, uh, and then install the, the cable beneath the intercoastal waterway. From there, it goes for about 16 and a half miles to a location on Union Avenue in the town of Brookhaven pre-disturbed area, you know, or just a couple parcels from existing industrial uses, including a concrete manufacturer. It's adjacent to, uh, to an existing power plant, a tank farm, and uh, other industrial uses. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good reuse of a brownfield site. And uh, you know, we look forward to starting that construction again towards the end of, of 2023. And then from that substation, we'll interconnect to the Holbrook substation about a mile away. Uh, one thing unique here on the, the top left hand is uh, it's not a direct um, perpendicular uh, entry in New York state waters. So versus the, the entry for, for South Fork, which is about three and a half miles in state waters, this will be on, coming in on a diagonal and uh, that was selected purposely because it minimizes the environmental impacts uh, through this location, but it does mean we'll extend for about six miles in New York waters. My next slide, and I think at this point I'm turning back to, uh, to Jen Garvey. Sure. 
Hey there. So um, just to hit on some of the some of the milestones that we have uh, achieved over the past year and and then some. Um, this is sort of a, a milestones in, in pictures, if you will, but um, we spent a lot of time doing site investigation and I know there's some discussion before of the uh, the lift the lift barge that was offshore. Um, off the coast of Wainscott, off the coast of Smith Point Beach. It, it was a, a spectacle when it was out there. Um, obviously made an Instagram feed here. But um, you know, th the intention here is just that you know, we, we do a, a huge amount of site investigation because we want to know as much about the location that we're working in as possible in order to um, just to, to design the best possible project. We want to you know, account for anything that we might find underground, for example, to make sure that all of our engineering design is, is aware of, of, uh, of what may exist there. This includes um, there's a lot of survey, survey work that goes on, soil testing. These were, these were offshore, um, offshore soil testing. That, that, was, that was the work that was done on this, on this lift barge. It obviously had to come quite close to shore. And so that's the need for this large vessel that stands up out of the water and is protected from wave action. Um, but in general, it's, it's, a, it's a really thorough site assessment process so that the, you know, the goal is that there are no surprises when you, when, you, when you move to construction and also just to inform um, the engineering design process to prove that you've uh, selected the, the least impactful way of approaching your point of interconnection. Next slide. But that means like a team of people have been out there over these the past couple of years, basically. I mean, we have surveyors, uh, you know, out in, in working in the roads. You know, these these site investigation teams doing these the soil boring work. Um, you know, we also have a deep bench of, of folks working at their desks, of course, uh, doing planning work and research and developing different uh, sets of plans. We have a team of attorneys, as you might imagine as well, uh, but there is a really deep bench of people that are a part of the development of these projects. And those are all jobs um, just to, to just so they get to the point where we can begin construction. We also purchased a building, a very large building. It's about 45,000 square feet and it's located in East Setauket, New York. Uh, so as part of as our, part of our commitments uh, for the Sunrise Wind Project, and I should mention that um, NYSERDA in New York obviously has the largest offshore wind goal in the entire state. It's in the entire nation, rather. It's nine gigawatts by 2035. And, you know, they're really going big soon with the specific intention of trying to capture as much of the supply chain pie as they can and, and making sure that New York really becomes a hub for offshore wind development that is recognized um, as a, you know, central to the industry throughout the entire eastern seaboard. So, um, as part of our commitment under Sunrise Wind, we have agreed to locate our operations and maintenance headquarters, which is, um, and by headquarters, I mean, it's a regional headquarters. It will serve all of our projects here in the Northeast. Um, and it and, and these and this operation will be located in uh, this this lovely building that we have purchased in East Atakit. Um and so we have about 22 people that we will be hiring in this year alone. Um, this project, this particular building, is still being renovated, um, and so it will be ready at the beginning of of uh, 2023. But um, this will really be a, a, an essential part of our operation, our oper operations and maintenance uh, operation for decades to come. Uh, you know, offshore wind uh, installations have expected engineered lives of about 25 years. We have projects starting up at different times. So, you know, this is a, a much longer term investment into uh, the Long Island community. So we look forward to um, all the work that's occurring here. There will be certainly more people located out of this building in time. In general, our commitment to uh, the operation and maintenance headquarters uh, in, in, in this area of Suffolk County, together with um, the location of our, you'll see it in a moment here, but the location of um, our service operation vessel at, at uh, its home port will be Port Jefferson. But this commitment alone will generate about 100 jobs, uh, long-term jobs in the region for Suffolk County. Next slide. So also this year, uh, we did ha begin hiring for our first round of offshore wind technicians. These are the people who will um, who will work out at sea. They will uh, be out on our turbines each day, uh, just you know, doing doing routine maintenance. Um, they're also there to if, if any if, if any if there should ever be um, an issue with the turbine, they go out to, to fix it. They do a lot of regular maintenance, um, but they they effectively live at sea, and so uh, these are. 
These are a unique crew of people, the first that we've hired here in the United States. Um, they will, because we don't have, uh, we don't have many offshore wind turbines here just yet, they will need to go to train to Europe uh, for this first round of train. It's just a, this first round of training, future training, you know, will, will begin to take place here in the United States as we have more turbines for their, for them to work on. It's about 18 months of training that is required in order to become, to become an offshore wind technician. And this group really needs to, to hit the ground running um, so the first turbines will be coming online, obviously, in, in uh, 2023 to support as part of South Fork Wind, and shortly thereafter, we'll have the turbines for one of our projects serving the Northeast, Revolution Wind, as well as Sunrise Wind. Uh, so a lot of work ahead. These are long-term jobs, as you might imagine, and they're they're really uh, they're really high-value jobs. Or said it is hard, is uh, investing heavily in the training of these folks, and so we want them to be with us for as long as they are willing. Um, and they are really important assets uh, to to the company. So um, that that hiring round has been underway this past fall. Um, it was 11 technicians that we we're hiring uh, in this initial round, and so we look forward to sending uh, the first the first folks that have accepted offers from us over to Europe to train beginning in March. Um, and so that's a, a really exciting development for us. Just even thinking that, you know, we're, we're so close to the, to, to steel in the water, if you will, that um, we're preparing our, our wind turbine techs. Can go to the next slide. And so this is that service operation vessel that I mentioned. Um, this is a this is where the turbine technicians will live. This is an enormous vessel, um, about the size of a large ferry, uh, and it's like as I mentioned, its its home port will be in Port Jefferson, New York, um, on the the north shore of Long Island. If that's uh, not a, a location that you that you recognize, uh, and the function of this boat is it's really a workhorse. It's meant to live at sea, but this is where um, you know rather than having technicians coming back and forth from the wind farm every day. Um, we well this this boat uh, is is where they'll live for two weeks on and then they'll come ashore for two weeks uh, but for this is this is their home for two for two weeks at a time um, and the 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 boat is specially outfitted so that there you can see this sort of tall tower uh, on the boat there and that's actually kind of like a uh, it's a walkway that will connect directly to the upper part of the turbine so that they can walk directly onto the turbine without having to kind of uh, climb up a ladder from the from the very bottom there they'll get right onto the the base platform of the of the turbine uh, but this is I mean, this is a, a vessel that is currently under construction. We announced this charter agreement last year, um, and so it takes a, a couple of years to build, but we look forward to this being ready and to housing our, um, our offshore wind uh, mechanics. Next vessel, or next slide. This was another important milestone that we, uh, that we, that we checked off this year. Um, you know, Orsted and Eversource certainly committed to the establishment of a U.S. supply chain for offshore wind, and we have some really unique vessels that need to be built in order to make that happen. Um, it does take time, and this is the first offshore wind vessel um, that has been commissioned. The, uh, this is for specifically for for turbine installation. Um, it's actually being built by a company called Dominion, um, but Orsted and Eversource will be the first to charter it for use. Uh, of the of the sunrise wind turbine installation. So um, it is under construction now, and we look forward to putting it to work, being the first to put it to work uh, when sunrise wind is heading into construction. But um, as we build up the U.S. fleet uh, with offshore wind supply vessels, this is a, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to really capture the size of these vessels. <laughs> um, you know, they really are tremendous, but this is a, a, a major investment uh, by Dominion. And, uh, you know, we are really excited to have this opportunity to, to be the first to use it. Next slide. Partnerships with the university is also, you know, a really important part of our success. And we have such a tremendous asset in Stony Brook University here on Long Island. This was a commitment that we made as part of our, our Sunrise Wind uh, proposal. Um, you know, Stony Brook obviously is a, a very well recognized research university. And so this was a, a partnership that we launched earlier this year 
Um, they have an advanced energy research and technology center uh, that really has been spearheading this work uh, together with the, the broader university. Obviously, there's a, a number of campuses at the university from the School of Marine and, School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences to the engineering school to the business school. They have uh, a really extraordinary uh, breadth of experts to, to support uh, the future of offshore wind. And so we, we look forward to, to all the, the good ideas that are coming out of Stony Brook University. And we have $5 million here uh, that'll be put to work to, to bring some of those ideas um, you know, to fruition. I'm proud to say that actually this made the, the list of top 10 um, top 10 news items for Stony Brook University uh, as part of their sort of recap of 2021. So that, that was exciting. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited to have them as partners. Next slide. And speaking of other supply chain announcements, uh, and I, I mentioned, you know, jobs and investment is really the, a theme of offshore wind is it's it's about energy but it's also about opportunity and investment and we made um this was a, a really this was a tremendous announcement that was made by the governor herself uh, back in uh october um her office uh was you know was 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 pleased to announce this 86 million dollar award it's the largest award to date uh, in, in New York State and a huge enabler of the supply chain that will support the uh, the, the fabrication and construction of advanced foundation components. So very technical sounding term, obviously, but you can see from the, the picture in the background, you know, we have uh, turbine stand on foundations that are in, in the case of uh, our project Sunrise Wind and Southwark Wind are actually monopile foundations. So they look a little bit different than the ones that you see there, kind of single pile, uh, one, one round, um, so one tube, if you will, in the water. But um, there, are, there are very complex and very large um, platforms that need to be uh, fabricated and constructed to create those uh, to create those those foundation platforms and so this tremendous work scope has been awarded to a company called Riggs Disler and the thing about supply chain awards is it's 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 sort of like a, a you know a it's like it's it's like the pebble in the pond. It creates a ripple effect of supply chain partners, um, you know, local supply chain partners. And so, Riggs Riggs Disler is the company that has the larger award, um, and they have a number of local entities that will be supporting this scope. Um, one of the great stories coming out of this is actually uh, the partnership with Lungstrom Steel, which is a company in Western New York, actually, uh, Wellsville, New York, where they will be doing the steel prefabrication. Uh, work, which will then get transported to the Port of Albany, where these very large pieces will be put together and then shipped out to the wind farm. Uh, so a bit of a, a technical uh, aspect to this, but the punchline is it's an awful lot of jobs and an awful lot of investment in order to, to make this, uh, this scope come together. Next slide. Another supply chain announcement that we made this year was uh, with respect to our transmission system. Um, our Sunrise Wind will be using an HVDC system. I will say that HVDC systems are not new for submarine purposes. Uh, there's actually a submarine, uh, an HVDC submarine cable that connects under Jones Beach, for example, but we will be the first offshore wind project to use it. And it has a number of different benefits and basically allows for us to use fewer cables. If we were to use, if you're familiar with AC power, DC power, the DC cable, uh, the DC option allows us to reduce the number of cables that are needed to bring our power to shore. It also helps to reduce losses, for example, over those longer distances. Um, it's really advanced technology and um, it, it, uh, it allows us to just, you know, carry our, our power farther, more economically, more efficiently. Uh, and so this very complex uh, package has been awarded to Siemens Anker and they too will have a, a local supply chain scope that will support their award. So, um, as you know, as developers, a lot of people think that we sort of are responsible for all of the supply chain activity that happens, we actually enable 
very large contracts, which then uh, we call those tier one contracts. People, entities that contract directly with us are called tier one suppliers. And from there, there are lots of, there are companies that contract with a tier one supplier and then someone contracts with a tier two supplier if if you if you follow me here but um it is a it's really a chorus of supply chain that makes these projects come to fruition and so um this is one of our our, our big ones um and we look forward to the uh, the you know the local announcements of of those contracts that will support this effort uh, here on long island next slide and you know, so that recaps really 2021 and some of our, our, our milestones of the last several months. Um, but we are just getting started still. Um, you know, for those of us who work in offshore wind every day, it does feel like we've been at this for a while and really it's just the beginning of the story. Um, obviously, Southwark Wind is moving to construction this year, which is tremendously exciting. Um, and there will be even more opportunities uh, to announce with, re with respect to so uh, supply chain for South Fork. Um, offshore construction will be starting up in 2023. Uh, and Sunrise Wind obviously has a ways to go in the permitting phase. There's still many opportunities for outreach and input as that project is finalized, its, its footprint is finalized, its mitigations and so on. Um, you know, we have uh, science is a big part of what we do. Um, we have a number of different initiatives to make sure that we're collecting the data that's needed to assess the potential impacts of our projects. And so those are uh, those are uh, those are opportunities that we look forward to announcing in 2022 together with workforce initiatives. Uh, the the work scope, the very big work scope that I mentioned up in the capital region, that advanced component supply uh, supply uh, sorry advanced foundation component supply chain award. It is a long, a long phrase. Um, you know, there's a, a million dollar workforce and uh, workforce development initiative that will accompany that. And so that's something that we'll see rolling out in 2022. Um, just funds being put to work to make sure that we can uh, prepare people for these opportunities, that we can cast the, the net wide so that, lots, uh, so that everyone has the opportunity to take advantage of these, these jobs that are, um, that are coming to fruition as offshore wind advances. Um, and then, you know, a, a, and a very important part of our commitment with respect to Sunrise Wind was also the National Offshore Wind Training Center. And that is something that we're working on with a, a, some terrific partners in labor and academia. Um, and that's something that we'll see some news on in 2022 as well, together with some more supply, supplier events, supply chain events. As I mentioned, you know, these are offshore wind is a multi-billion dollar industry and whenever that kind of money is in play there's a lot of opportunity to be had so um it's about the you know we're, we're working hard to make sure that everyone becomes aware of the opportunities that are coming and and it is and uh, can understand how to be how, how to be a part of it and i think with that we'll move to questions great thank you so much jen and ken the Jen and Ken team for not the first time and surely for not the last time. Um, uh, I want to remind folks, although you, there's been a lot of activity, if you would like to ask a question, please drop it into the Q&A function. Uh, we will be sending around a recording uh, of tonight's presentation with a thank you email to everyone who registered. So if you got here late, you'll be able to access that and it will be available on, uh, I think both our and CCE's um, websites or, or YouTube pages. So there will be available later, just as a reminder. Um, so we have a lot of questions. So I think Adrian and I are gonna tag team to try and um, combine where they, where they are and, um, to try and, and get to as many questions as we can, but we may run out of time. Um, and some of you that already have five questions in there, if you can limit your own so other people can get a chance, that would be good too. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna start. Uh, the question is, who's constructing the wind turbines? Are they being manufactured in the United States? Dan, if you want, Jen. So for South Fork, we have announced it's uh, the, the, the turbine manufacturer is Siemens Gamesa, and it's an 11 megawatt turbine, and they are manufactured uh, in Europe. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine some of these only because we're up to almost 30 questions, and we don't want to be here till tomorrow morning and have breakfast together. Um, just some of the environmental questions. So can you talk about what are the mitigation um, 
techniques that you'll be using to protect migratory uh, whales uh, in the area and also um, the for birds for the Atlantic um, flyway zone. Sure. You know what, I, I did want to ask Melanie Guron is on the line here and um, I asked that she join us. Melanie yeah. is the permitting manager for, for South Fork Wind. She's also now supporting Sunrise Wind since we're moving to a different phase. And uh, Melanie is, uh, she's a scientist. She's actually a, a fishery scientist by background. And, uh, you know, she has been shepherding this project and so many of the environmental conditions. So Melanie, if you wouldn't mind coming on screen so here. Yeah, hi, can everybody hear me? Great. Yeah. So we'll yes, take the heard. whales. <laughs> we'll take the whales first. It's a great question. Um, we are working very closely with the federal government, um, in particular the National Marine Fisheries Service. And um, we have a particular authorization, it's called an incidental harassment authorization that's just been issued to the project for South Fork, for example. And that um, authorization has several measures in it, including um, soft start for pile driving measures. We're measuring sound source, very, you know, sound source coming from the pile driving. We have speed vessel speed restrictions that are in place. And all of these are the types of measures that we have discussed, the sort of best management practices that we have in place and that will be required um, to be in compliance with during the construction period. Some of the other sort of pieces of that puzzle include protected species observers, um, both on our transiting vessels during construction and operations that'll be on the lookout for different um, endangered species and marine mammals, protected species such as sea turtles as well. Um, so include th those observers are, are part of that overall equation. We also have during construction and actually some long-term monitoring where we're gonna be using some passive um, acoustic monitoring systems or some underwater hydrophones that are gonna be listening all the time for whale um, vocalizations and things like that. And you know, during construction, that passive acoustic monitoring piece will be live. We'll be able to hear and recognize those calls right away. And um, we have, you know, stop gaps in place basically where um, if a sighting is made while you know we're doing a specific activity then our activity then either gets scaled back or shut down until the area then clears of of those particular protected species under the endangered species act as well as the marine mammals protection act so that's just sort of a glimpse at some of the mitigations um, that we're you know putting our best foot forward on um, as you all know, the North Atlantic right whale is a species that quite a few folks are very concerned about. It's highly endangered and we have actually a separate set of rules specific to that, to that population as well. Um, for the birds, we have um, sort of a slightly different set of, of mitigation um, you know, a mitigation framework that we've put forth for South Fork. And you can expect that a lot of the same um, like a lot of the same measures that I'm talking about here will also be put into place for the Sunrise Project as well. Um, for the birds, we actually are involved um, very closely with the Audubon Society and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on some different tagging um, projects. We're looking at pit tags on very various different birds, as well as listening, and we've got sonars that are going to be radars that will be mounted on various turbines so that we're always monitoring um, bird and also actually bat activity. Um, we also have bird deterrent devices that um, were required to mount on the turbines as well. So it, as well as one more thing, we'll probably be, we will be doing boat-based surveys um, where we'll be doing bird counts around um, the turbines in the area of the projects. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna try to batch a couple of labor related questions, because we've gotten a number of them, and I think that this, they might be able to be answered together. One uh, is pretty straightforward, is whether there's been a location selected for the national offshore wind training. Two is um, sort of how many jobs there are, are for the longer term um, operation and maintenance. 
And then three, which is in the sort of scope, um, is a question asking if contractors have been selected and subcontractors and what that might mean for, for the labor unions and, and who they can be working with. Obviously that would be for the South Fork project because for Sunrise, I, I'm guessing you're not, you're not at that point in, in life. So how's those sort of for a batching of questions? Sure. All right, so I can start off with, um, with respect to the National Offshore Wind Trading Center, we haven't announced a location for that just yet. Um, it's an entity that's been created. They're actively working on site selection. So uh, I do expect that'll be news in 2022. Uh, with respect to the O&M jobs, so we have, um, I mentioned, obviously, we've just done the first round of hiring for 13 techs, um, you know, is, the, is part of the first round of hiring. Obviously, South Fork Wind is only, is a small, is a smaller wind farm. It's only 12 turbines. Um, I can't say that the jobs scale up, you know, at the same rate as do the turbines, for example, um, but they are obviously long-term jobs, you know, they're, you know, we hope that you stay for for your career, essentially, uh, working as, as as long as you can, uh, working as an as an OMN and technician. And um, so, in terms of numbers, I think I think we have just want to I think we I I think what's it, I'm going to say it's about well over we should be well over like 20 at least by the time we get through through sunrise wind. I think about I think maybe 20 closer to 25 as we get to sunrise wind, uh, just so to support the the suite of of projects that are in the Northeast. I would add to that, that there's also going to be a, a control center and there'll yes. be, uh, you know, three shifts a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So that'll, that'll in, include uh, our workforce to do that. There'll be the planning and logistics function here in, in the US that plans and schedules all of the maintenance activities and to support the maintenance activities, we will be having uh, helicopter service as well as uh, vessel service that will, uh, you know, man the Jones Act compliant vessels that we're building. Uh, several of those that Jen spoke about have already been announced. I saw in the chat that there was questions about how many vessels and, and where are they coming from. We've procured several other vessels. We haven't made the announcement yet. Um, but there are several other U.S.-based vessels that are being uh, constructed for our projects. And with that will come, the, obviously, the crews that are necessary to support that. That, that will be, while we're purchasing those, uh, you know, those vessels, we will crew them with, uh, you know, with, a, with a service provider, the same as for the helicopter service. Thank you, Ken. Right. I was thinking too literally about our own technicians. <laughs> Thank you for answering the question before we got to ask it too. Um, okay, we're gonna go to the next one. We have several questions uh, logged in here about the issue of the radar. Um, so question is, how have you or how will you uh, be able to you know, rectify the issue of um, radar and potential interference by wind turbines as it has been cited by the Coast Guard? So there's a, a couple different uh, concerns with offshore wind farms. Uh, the first is for radar used by the Department of Defense or the FAA, and that's primarily focused around air transportation. There's several studies out there. In fact, you can you can find them on the BOEM website. They've commissioned those studies, and they've come up with mitigation measures for for both commercial aircraft as well as to address any of the military concerns. Uh, the military concerns also include search and rescue for the Coast Guard, which is probably the most critical activity that the Coast Guard does outside of, you know, obviously protecting our, our coastlines. Uh, and we've agreed with the, the U.S. Coast Guard for a, a process that we would shut down wind turbines, including the entire wind farm, during their search and rescue operations. So if a uh, either a recreational boat user or a commercial fisherman were to, were to have issues at sea and the Coast Guard had to respond, we've already made that commitment up front to curtail our operations during the times when they would have to do that search and rescue. There's a second group of, of concerns around the actual vessel um, radar and interference. And what we've found to date anyway, is it's especially the older radars 
are susceptible to um, backscatter or misoperation within the wind farm itself. And what we've pr provided is a method to upgrade radar systems for commercial fishermen at, at no cost to them as part of our, our program. And that will both give them the latest technology, but also a technology that is least susceptible to any of these impacts of, of a, you know, operating within the wind farm itself. Thank you. There's um, a few questions about costs. Um, so the question is, you know, how much does the cost per megawatt versus other countries or, um, or how how is this how is this going to impact ratepayers? Um, I think those are a couple of questions that have been asked about cost uh, relative to um, either existing energy or or energy and you know in other parts of the world. Sure. So we we can speak to um, you know certainly the cost of our projects here the. Um, I'll, I'll start with the South Fork Wind. Um, that was obviously a contract with, with LIPA and, um, you know, that, that particular contract um, can help me out here with the, with the pricing that I recall, because it's, it's been a long, it's been a little while since we talked about this. Uh, there's, but two, there's, that, actually, there's actually two tiers to it. Uh, the first tier, yeah. original 90 megawatts is priced at about 16 cents per kilowatt hour. The second uh, tier of, or 40 megawatts is priced at about 8.6 cents a kilowatt hour. So the composite is around 14 cents. So that is, uh, say, I would say a premium to fossil based generation at this point. Um, uh, it is um, probably less costly than, than solar at this point. And uh, the costs for that also escalate at a 2% per year. The price in a little, little bit different type of contract for, for Sunrise. That's an all in price for renewable energy credits, uh, OREX, and that's at about 11 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so there's, you know, there is an economy of scale with a larger wind farm, um, but it's still priced above, say, the, uh, the wholesale market, which in New York clears with, with natural gas. And I, I think we should mention that, um, you know, NYSERDA, obviously this is a, the NYSERDA offshore wind master plan is a statewide program. And so NYSERDA has said, you know, when the first two contracts that were a part of, uh, that came from the solicitation that they ran back in 2019, that's the part, that's the contract, uh, the procurement that Sunrise Wind was a part of, there's also a project by Equinor. Uh, and, and NYSERDA said that the cost to the average rate pair for those two projects combined was less than a dollar per month. So just to, to do it in terms of in terms of how it affects uh, you know someone's wallet, so to speak. And important to remember that we are currently not factoring in the all the pollution costs associated with fossil fuel power um, outside of some carbon um, pricing through the regional greenhouse gas initiative. Um, so and I think in Sorry, I was just going to say, in addition to that, you know, if you look at the cost of oil, uh, which went up $3 a barrel in one day last week, and now it's up to $81 a barrel, up from $70 a barrel just a month ago, uh, it's a very uh, volatile and unpredictable world for fossil fuels. And uh, for the cost of wind, we know what it's going to be for 20 years. There'll be a 2% increase per year escalation clause, and that's it. It's not subject to geopolitical circumstances or resources. Good point. Okay, let's move on to the next questions. Uh, I'm just gonna ask a few of the short ones. I'm gonna ask two. One is um, someone's asking, will the pylon anchors uh, be designed to provide marine life habitat? And then another I thought, good question is, um, do you expect the timeline to shorten in the future? If so, by how much? And how does the timeline in America compare to other countries? So let's ask the Anchorage uh, question first, answer that one first. Melanie, do you wanna take that one? Sure. sure. Yeah, so around the base of where the, the pylons are gonna come in, these monopiles are gonna come into the seafloor and almost like in a donut shape around each of those, we're going to be placing something that we call scour protection. And that's that sort of 
anchoring system that I think you're you're just you're thinking about um, those that that material the scour protection is typically made out of um, sort of chopped up rocks and stones and so um, that typically does support um, you know it, it increases and it supports sort of that uh, complex habitat or that habitat that Ken was talking about earlier that's that essential fish habitat that really does support spawning of fish populations. So we do anticipate there being um, some positive net benefits to them to that scour protection being on the seafloor and acting almost as like an artificial reef. Um, there's also, you know, some other mitigations that we were talking about with federal government um, near the locations of the of the of the of the monopiles that you know actually may be some structural we may actually go in and put what they call some nature inclusive designs down or some structural pieces on the seafloor nearby that actually in even increases that reef effect even more and um, we may also run some experiments or some some surveys that kind of observe especially in the first few phases where we've got these turbines installed sort of how beneficial those types of nature inclusive designs are try to get some data points on it i think the second part of that question was around the, the duration and timeline um i think in general we're seeing a, a you know our revolution wind project and our sunrise wind projects that have come after south fork we see the timeline being a, a little bit compressed, uh, but I still think with a full environmental review we do under the National Environmental Policy Act that we're still going to see a, a pretty lengthy duration from the time, so say in, in February when the new leases are, are, are leased in New York and New Jersey until they actually you know go into operation. That's still multiple years to go through that process. You go through a, you know, you, you secure the lease, there's a site assessment process. Uh, then there's a, a COP process. Ultimately, federal permits and the state permits are usually within that time frame. But that overall process, for example, for South Fork, those leases were secured in, in 2013. We're going into construction in 2022. So <laughs> I think the process will be shortened, but I still think it's going to be uh, an extended process versus other countries where, in most times, when the, when the auction is held, it comes with all of the permits necessary for that project. So they go right to the execution phase at that point. So yeah, I think that's an important point. I was just gonna say, sorry, that that, you know, it's just interesting how, it's, it's a, a real difference in how we do business, right? With respect to offshore wind is that in other countries often they, they do permit first. So the, the bid is more precisely on the construction phase. And we're kind of doing goals on parallel tracks here. All right, so we want to try to get some more questions. Julie, you're next. Yeah, so I'm going to try and do what you did, a few short questions. Um, I think you just kind of answered that the, this one question, but is there a layout for the turbines for the Sunrise Project? I think the answer is probably not yet. So a final layout, no. That, that will come out of the environmental impact statement in the, uh, the environmental review. There's a draft okay. layout in our, in our construction operation plan, but many of those turbines and those turbine positions uh, will probably be removed through the various processes of either visual impacts, probably not so much for sunrise, but probably more for the essential fish habitat or other things that we find within that lease area, cultural resources such as shipwrecks or, or other things that are you know, in the waters off the coast. Great. What type of stand will be used for the wind turbine? I think we've kind of answered this already, but the monopile? Yeah. So in general, these are 10 or 11 meter diameter monopoles or monopiles, I should say. Um, so they're 30 plus feet across and depending upon the depth of water and the um, type of soil conditions at the exact location is how long or how tall they are. So they, they basically come out of the water, as, as you can see on the, the pictures, uh, several meters above the water line and then the, the advanced foundation component for the platform, the, the, the railings, uh, the ladders are placed uh, on top of the monopile. And then on top of that goes the monopole for the, uh, for the wind turbine generator itself. Okay. Uh, let's get to some from, 
Sorry, were you done, Julie? No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get some uh, some from Surf Rider here from Matt. Uh, do the lawsuits against Vineyard Wind affect uh, either of your projects, Orsted's projects, directly or indirectly? And also, is the Sunrise Wind uh, project planning on using open loop cooling for the offshore DC substation? So I can take the, the first one, maybe Mel can, can take the second one. She can describe the impacts of that, that open loop system more than I can. But uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the lawsuits that I'm aware of against Vineyard Wind, which there, there may be more than I'm aware of, they're challenging the uh, approvals by the federal agencies, including the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Department of Interior. If those challenges were to be sustained or were successful, uh, that may have may, might have impact on our permits as well. So the second part of the question about the open loop cooling um, system, yes, we are right now, the project has um, proposed to utilize such a system. Um, to kind of go back to some of the, you know, the points that Ken was making and Jen was making about um, the DC system, you know, we need to have a cooling system on the converter station offshore. That's the that offshore substation. When we convert the, the electricity from AC to DC uh, at that station and then send it up down across the export cable, we need that cooling system to basically efficiently cool that process. And that also helps with electrical losses. We basically see that that cooling system sort of reduces that, that risk for losing more electricity as well. So that open loop cooling system is sort of, it contains sort of two components. One is an intake, an ocean, ocean water intake. That's usually mounted typically about 10 meters off the bottom below the converter station in the water, that pipe. That pipe takes in seawater, comes through the system, and then there's a discharge. And the caisson for the discharge is about, oh, 12 meters below the surface of the water. So the reason why we have things, you know, more mid water column is because we, we don't want to be near the seabed, wherever the water is getting intake or discharged. Now at the intake, we have screens, various different um, mitigations that we put in place in addition to mounting that intake and discharge sort of mid water column so that it doesn't affect the seafloor. We also have screens in place that help not, you know, entrain and impinge fish and marine life. So there will be some, there's some impingement that occurs sort of inevitable with some ichthyoplankton, smaller critters and plankton in, this, in, the, in, in the water column. But as everybody knows, that's, those animals are, are pretty ubiquitous and there's a lot out there. So yes, we do plan um, to, to use that system and we're trying to work with the agency as well and look at technology that's out there to continue to sort of develop what mitigations we can have in place. We're also looking at doing assessments to support what we think those impacts are gonna be. And that will be part of the overall um, federal assessment and then environmental review. All right, thank you for thank that. You. Um, two, I think, related questions is, um, uh, one is, how do you plan to work with low wind speed and high wind speed, um, which may impact the, you know, the ability of the turbines to, to work properly? I'm not answering this question well. Um, asking that question. And <laughs> I'll start with that one. So, so on average, the capacity factor for an offshore wind farm is around 50% but there's variability both throughout the day as well as seasonally. Seasonally in the, in the winter months, like where we are now, you can get up to a 60% capacity factor. In the summer months, the summer doldrums, you tend to be down closer to the 40%. But over the, you know, the 8,760 hours per year, the average is around 50%. So the South Fork wind farm on average will put out you know, 66 megawatts on, on every hour on the hour. Obviously there's variability. High wind speeds above 70 miles an hour, the, the turbine itself starts to take actions, you know, feathering into the wind, you know, locking the blades in a certain position and kind of hunkering down for the, the, the storms we could see here in the Northeast. The ratings on this equipment, both the foundations as well as the turbines are rated for the hurricanes that we normally see here in, in the Northeast. 
as far as low wind speeds go, one of the, the things that the manufacturers are doing now and one of the advantages of the, the longer blades uh, is better low speed wind performance. So they're starting to be able to operate at much slower wind speeds than the previous generation of turbines had. And as we go forward into the, you know, the 14, 16, 20 megawatt turbines, I will think, I think they'll probably also have superior low wind speed performance than even the turbines that we're using. So f uh, sort of related to that, and then we probably, Adrian, you want to ask one more and then we can wrap up here because it's 826, um, is the question of, is there an opportunity for onshore battery storage or and or offshore battery storage associated with turbine sites to sort of smooth out some of the, the things that you're talking about now? Yes. So most people don't realize, but East Hampton, East Hampton substation also has a battery storage unit and Montauk substation has a battery storage unit. LIPA purposely combined those two right. battery storage units with the South Fork Wind Project. So they were thinking ahead several years ago when they did this solicitation and those two are actually in service today and operating. So yes, there's, there's certainly an opportunity for coupling onshore battery storage with, uh, with renewable energy, doesn't necessarily have to be Offshore wind could be onshore wind, could be solar, uh, to extend those valleys while using the peak energy when it may not be needed in the middle of the night. Uh, also, there's lots of activity going on now with hydrogen and being able to produce hydrogen. Orsted has some, some really large commercial projects uh, ad advancing in Europe for the offshore wind energy in the form of hydrogen much, much more dense than say battery storage. So that has great promise in the future as well. All right, we're gonna get in uh, two quick last questions. Uh, one is John wants to know, which I think is a good question, are there performance guarantees for output for either of the projects? And the second to last one is um, if you could just be a little clearer, Bernard's asking the interconnecting cables between the turbines. Do they drop state straight down from the turbine and then run along the bottom of the sea and then connect to the next one? Just mention how that works. So two completely different questions, but that's okay. Uh, yes. Performance well, I'm guarantees. I'm trying to get them in here. I mean, you're here and there's a big audience and they're trying to get their questions answered. So we're squeezing them in there, Ken. So, so you could do it. So we get paid when the turbines operate and we deliver to, to our customers, either NYSERDA or Lightbutt. If we don't deliver, we don't get paid. So we, we have a vested interest in making sure the maximum uh, output from these turbines uh, is done in a, in a safe manner. The second question around how do the uh, cables come up? They come up, they are, they go from each turbine to turbine. In our case, it's a 66 kV medium voltage AC cable, three conductors in a bundle about this size. Um, they come along the seafloor and then go up into the foundation at a hole in the foundation and into the bottom of the uh, uh, advanced foundation component or that, that, that thing that's just above the water, the platform. And that's where the electrical cables from the turbine connect with those cables. On the substation end, again, they come up through, uh, through a, 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 a tube, let's say, uh, that goes into the water and they go into and into the switch gear on the offshore substation on the other end. Great, well, thank you both so much. Um, I'll be very brief and then I'll turn it over to Adrian. But thank you again to Jen and to Ken and to Mel for answering so many questions tonight. We have more questions in the queue and I'm sorry we're not able to get to them all, um, but we certainly were glad to see so many people so actively engaged and people staying so long. Um, I can assure you that we will be holding more of these forums in the future um, to keep people apprised of issues, both NYLCV Education Fund and Citizens Campaign for the Environment. Um, I would encourage you all to follow uh, both of our organizations and Orsted and Eversource on social media and signing up for our email list so you get more information. Um, so keep an eye out for that on, on both offshore wind and on clean energy. As I mentioned earlier, 
the, the recording of this will be sent to everyone who registered and it will be available on NYLCV and CCE's YouTube channels. So thank you so much and Adrian. Yeah, just again, thank you for everyone for participating. We had a really large audience. I know it's frustrating when some of your questions are asked, but you didn't get them to have, uh, you know, we didn't get to answer them. Um, we did try to move through them as expeditiously as we could, but we will be having more of these. Stay tuned. We're going to be breaking ground with, uh, you know, New York State's first offshore wind farm this year. It's a reason to celebrate. There will be a lot of questions as they come up, as they should. And we are going to provide forums um, for you to be able to ask questions to the people who know. So thank you again, everybody. Have a good night.